beautiful journey through the book of Isaiah. We are in chapter 2, verse 6 to 11. That's uh, what I think is true that we will read today. You will agree with me that uh, truly Isaiah was, was a great craftsman and how that the Lord communicated his work to us through Isaiah, how he crafted it, and you will see packages of packages, about seven of those packages of his prophecies and in, in somewhat cyclical form, that you would think some of them are actually repetition, but when you look closely, you would see God's leading with the children of Israel by raising of largely by the name of apostasy. So today we will look at Isaiah chapter 2 from verse 6 and at some point you will see us going backward and forward. Uh, that is how we have arranged how things will look like in the course of this year. As we study this thing, behold, I am doing a new thing. Let us pray. We thank you Lord for your words. It is an act of your grace to us that you have given us to study so we can know you more, so we can learn to walk with you more and live with one another. And reach our hearts and stick to us this morning as we read together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm reading from the New World Translation of NIV. <clears throat> you, Lord, have abandoned your people the descendants of Jacob. They are full of superstition from the east. They practiced divination like the Philistines and embraced pagan customs. Their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There is no end to the chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. So people, will be brought low, and everyone humbled. Do not forgive them. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant will be humbled, and human pride brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and will be humbled. For all the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan, for all the towering mountains and all the high hills, for every lofty tower and every fortified wall, for every trading ship and every stately vessel, the arrogance of man will be brought low, and the human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols will totally disappear. People will flee to caves in the rocks, and to holes in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. In that day, people will throw away to the moles and bats their idols of silver and idols of gold, which they made to worship. They will flee to caverns into the rocks and to the overhanging crags from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. Stop trusting in mere humans who have got a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in the sea? Amen. Amen. The Lord bless the reading of his word. We are looking at the topic today, the purifying anger of the Lord. The purifying anger of the Lord. Now many times, or permit me to even say that to human minds, when we talk about anger, we always see it in the negative. It's always to us an outburst of, of emotions that are very harsh and the person that anger is directed towards will not find it easy. But the anger of the Lord is not to be viewed in that order. His anger, as we look at the passage we are considering, especially with respect to his relationship with the children of Israel and the covenant that they had entered, then you would know that God's anger is a holy anger. The idea of God's anger is to drive his children away from idols and to bring them back to himself. 
Otherwise, the anger of humans is to send whoever they are angry with away from them, while to God is to bring his children back to himself. And looking at the passage we have read today, you will come to see that the ultimate goal of the prophet is to call the nation to repentance from the sins that they have committed. They have violated every of the covenant agreements and the ethics of the community of believers. They have lost direction and have forgotten who they were, and they have equally forgotten who God was to them. Now the prophet's call was so that they would come back and walk in the way of the Lord and trust God in every of his resources that he has, that he has provided for them, not to trust in themselves. God was calling upon the nation to understand that all power, all glory, all honor belongs only to God. And we will look at this in three uh, points and then we will conclude. And we will apply uh, as we journey through and see how closely related these words, you know, simple to always point at someone when something is in the negative and is being presented. But when you look closely to the words of the prophet, the words of God, you will see that they relate very much even with us in this very quiet time. <coughs> So we'll apply uh, anywhere uh, as we journey through the passage together. The first point talks about redefining man's value. So the purifying anger of the Lord is to redefine man's values. One of the main purposes of God's punishment for the children of Israel is so that they can start thinking well of the person of God and the nature of the value system that accompanies the covenant agreement that they have entered. How that a covenant community ought to think and to act and to see themselves and to also see the God that they serve. Now the nation had abandoned Yahweh and they had taken after the ways as the scripture tells us. Practices and definitions like the people of the East in their superstitious beliefs. Now, when we talk about East of Israel, you will have the Assyrians, uh, the Arabs, the Babylonians. Now, even in geography today, you will know that from, from the land of Israel, these nations we mentioned are to the East of Israel. And so, the prophet will mention that the nation had abandoned the wisdom of God, their covenant relationship agreement with God. And they began to peg themselves to become full of superstition, superstitions that they learned from the people of the East. And you will know that at different times, in the course of the war situations they were fighting, instead of seeking the help of God, many times they would go to the Assyrians and try to form an allegiance with them so that they will assist them. Even when they were fighting between themselves and their brothers in the north, they went to the Assyrians to help them deal with the Israelites. So those from the southern kingdom of Israel called Judah formed allegiance with Assyrians to deal with the northern kingdom called Israel. And whenever another nation will come to attack, instead of looking up to God, they were looking up to other nations to assist them in defeating those ones. So, they had abandoned Yahweh and they have decided to take after the ways of the Assyrians and other Eastern nations. Here is described as being superstitious. Of course, in those days, the people of the East were seen as learned people because the East was seen as center of civilization during those days. And you would remember that those wise men that came to greet Jesus when he was born, they were said to be from where? From the east. Okay? And they practiced astrology as well, which is why it was said of them to have followed what? A star. So they saw a star and they followed that star to come and greet baby Jesus. 
Well, the point here is placing importance and focus on human wisdom and values. This will result to placing a human being in the place of God. Because God is the all knowing, is the all wise God. When his wisdom is abundant and the focus has now turned to the wisdom of men, then men have been placed in the place of God. And this is the heart of idolatry. You remember the book Kinesor, when he taught himself to be a great God, and he asked that people worship him. Now, this is what the wisdom of men can do. Draw attention to self, and draw attention to any other human, so that that human will be worshipped. I think you will agree with me that these things are very closely related to what we are experiencing even in our country today. And even in the whole world, it's, it's, it's a human syndrome that exists and lives uh, with us. Again, the prophet will observe that on the other hand, they have taken into divination uh, as the Philistines. Now the Philistines were to the west of uh, Israel. So, Definition will be something we would know as foretelling, okay? And it is almost normal with a typical human being that does not or has not installed God as his own Lord to want to know what does my future hold. See, the sad thing about the whole thing is the children of Israel knew their future. The Lord has told them everything that was going to come their way, but they were not satisfied with that. They would still practice foretelling, which will imply that they will go to some kind of mediums. In our contemporary uh, setting here, we will call them going to sorcerers or witch, witch doctors, you know, something like that. Like the story is told of someone who went to a witch doctor and said he wanted to know his destiny, his future. Is it bright or is it gloomy? So the witch doctor took some insects. Some of you must have read it in social media. So he took an insect and he drew two cycles. Okay, he said, This is good luck, this is bad luck. Uh, why is it worrying? <laughs> <laughs> he said, This is good luck, uh, and then this is bad luck. So if this worm wriggles its way into this cycle of good luck, your future is bright. But if it goes to the bad luck, you are in trouble. So, he did some incantations and then he placed that worm and the worm began to move. And it was moving to good luck and the guy was smiling. And then just at the boundary of the line to entering good luck, the worm paused. And then the worm now turned and started going towards bad luck. And that guy was watching, was watching with anxiety. The worm was going to bad luck, it was going to bad luck. I was almost going to enter inside the cycle. And the young man quickly picked the worm. <laughs> And he placed it inside the good doctor. <laughs> and, and the witch doctor was right there watching. And he said, What are you doing? He said, Well, I can't sit and watch my destiny go to, <laughs> go to places. For me, I hold my destiny in my hands. <laughs> well, if, 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 if he knew that his destiny was in his hands in the first place, why did he go? So he took it and put it in good luck. We are always worried. We want to know what tomorrow holds for us. Even after we've been told. I have given my disclaimer here. Why I have remained a Christian. It's because I know where I'm going to. The Lord has told me that clearly. No confusion about it. I don't know about you, but I know about myself. That I know where I'm going to. So I'm not worried. If someone comes in today and tells me um, I was dead and somebody prayed for me and I came back to life, it's not this flash. It doesn't trick me. I don't care. Because I know ultimately you will what again? You will die. Oh yeah. Most certainly you will still die. Otherwise, Lazarus would have been with us today. That was even raised by Jesus himself. I'm concerned about the glorified body that I will have at the appearing of Jesus. Except that one, take any other one away from me. So I know where I'm going to. I don't need some miracle to confirm that to me. I don't need some magical happenings or some foretelling or something. The Bible has told me everything I need to know. I don't want to know more. Even the one that they say, I've not finished doing it. 
before somebody will come and be adding some things to us, and then many people will follow them. This is what ignorance does. When you have a secret in your hands. So the children of Israel that had the living God, and when the prophet will make reference to them as being the children of Jacob, is to call their minds to history, how God dealt with their parents, their forefathers, formed them into a nation, performed mighty acts among them. They were still following cheap things. You have the value of things, but you still follow cheap things. Some of you, we have you here on Sundays, but during the weekdays, you follow cheap things somewhere. I wonder what you're looking for. The prophet was telling them that these alliances that you are making with these people, you are clapping their hands with them. You know, clapping of hands like in high five, high five, to show you the depth of friendship that they have established with these people. And the effect of it is what we see in verse 7 and 8. By reason of embracing these pagans, their land became so wealthy with silver and gold, no end to their treasures. They filled their own war arsenals with horses and, and chariots. Now, chariots would be something like uh, our tank that we have today. So they had multiple of those ones. They again, by reason of this, Alliances, they began to bring idols, and their land became filled with idols, and they bowed unto the work of their hands in worship. What a detestable thing. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16 to 17, you will see that the Lord had forbidden them, especially addressing the kings of Israel, from accumulating gold and war arsenal. And the reason is this. So that the nation will learn to trust in him for provision. And in accumulating horses, so that the land will, the land will learn to trust in him for protection. He was their king. What else were they looking for? What did they do for the mighty walls of Jericho to come down? They used diggers and bombs. They just simply went round. How many times? Seven times. Is that too hard to do? See, the seven times was not their work to bring the walls down. It was an act of celebration before it happened. And then it happened. Do you know what happens when you worship God? Victory is sure. God wanted them to learn to trust only in Him. But you see, there's nothing wrong with wealth. But when you accumulate these things and think that they will give you the safety, the protection, and the provision that you need, you've missed the point. I said to someone on a lighter note that I think I may need to, when they talk about how people are stashing guns, I said these are very small things. Me, if I have the opportunities and I'm not tired, I'll buy and I'll put it in front of my house. Did you know that? <laughs> You know that if, if you want to open it, you will not joke with me. Okay, even if my house is in the middle of a tomorrow, you will not joke with me if it's an hour tag I have. Will that protect you? If God is on your side, forget it. Forget it. But if God is against you, then you are in trouble. They have accumulated all of these things, but it is obvious from our passage that by reason of these alliances, they have gone into deep relationships with the pagan nations. And by reason of that, they were also sharing in the gods of these people. Instead of showing God's light to those people, those people led them to accumulate all of these things that were going to provoke the anger of God. So they filled themselves with the view of wealth and power at the way of the world. They were relying upon their wealth for provision and their military might for protection. God wanted to take away these things to protect them. But they were not protecting themselves and they went into all of this. They added to their wealth multitude of idols. 
In fact, the Bible says the land was littered with idols. They were just everywhere. And the prophet described idols as the work of man's own hands. Look at verse 8. They bow down to the work of their hands. How sad, how sad. See, <coughs> it was very disgusting before God because this is a reverse. God created man so that man will what? Will worship God. But man went and created idols. So, it made the idols worship you now. Because you are the creator. But then you created, see, it's like one of the prophets said. They go to the forest, chop off some wood, come shape it together, and form it into an image, carry the pieces. You know now, we are in the cold weather now. Carry the pieces and put them in the fire to warm yourself. And then the one that you have carved into an image, you go to one corner and bow to it again and wash it. When it is the same pieces that you use to warm yourself. Papa! Where is wisdom in this? It was a reverse. And I see idols today as some of the resources that many of us have. When we make those resources or gifts or arts to become so important to us above God. As I said earlier, having those things is not a problem, but the value we attach to them, that is what happened to the children of Israel and caused them to be ready. But you see, when you have the living God, and you decide to focus on something different. And many times, people do that in search of some kind of fulfillment or satisfaction. You will not get it. Because any heart that does not have God is empty. I always like talking about one of these songs that I, I hear my children listen to. Uh, this donut repair club. One video, one gospel video that they sing a song and say, life without Jesus is like a donut. Because a donut has a hole in the middle of it. That is how the heart of those without God is. With a big hole. And there are many cravings that people pursue in order to fill that void. Because that void must be filled. That is where idol worship comes in. And that is why today, for many of us, we find ways to fill that hole in drugs. The Gideon of those told us about how people tear Bible cover, Bible pages, because the pages in the Bible are very light and, and very nice to wrap. And they wrap them into beads. I remember the story uh, that Pausifa told us on Tanka. Somebody who was given the Bible and he said, Oh, what a beautiful gift to smoke all of my, my weed with. So, he smoked the entire matching. <laughs> smoked all of my. I mean, I said that guy must have been a heavy. He smoked the loop completely. <laughs> but by the time he got to John, something happened. Yeah. And that's how he got his transformation. For some is drugs, for some is alcohol, for some is sex, for some is wrong relationships, for some is food. The Bible tells us that for some their God is what? Their stomach. Everything that they will eat. Food. Food, glorious food. What is it that has become your own God today? That you have abandoned Yahweh in order to follow that God? So their value system was not reflecting the covenant relationship that they are entering with God anymore. Their value system and their view of God were completely twisted. Judah was to be lied to the nations. Instead, she allowed the nations to darken her land. When you go into the community that you are to witness to, if care is not taken, you will be won over and your lamp will no longer shine. Judah was to shape the world but she allowed the world to shape her. 
and beat her into their own alliance. And that is what most believers have sadly become today. We have formed alliances with the world, especially in our politics. There are many believers today, they've gone so deep in their alliance with unbelievers that today they have lost their faces. Do I need to call names? Many of them exist. They claim to be Christians. Maybe they are. But because of the kind of alliances and friendships they have formed in the name of politics, they have lost themselves and they've lost every of their values. So also in the business world. Forming alliances, strong alliances with unbelievers, if you are not careful, you will sink. We've listened to testimonies of how some of our people wanted to be dragged into one big hole. But the Lord did it them. So it's good to do business, it's good to do politics, don't get me wrong. But when you form a strong alliance with unbelievers to the point that you clap hands to them, it means you've gone very deep. You are lost completely. It will be very difficult for you to be deep. Unless the Lord himself does something. And that is what we're trying to look at in the history of the children of Israel. That is why many of us have lost our, our testimony. We can no longer minister. We can no longer witness. We no longer see God correctly. See, if you cannot see God correctly, then you cannot relate with Him correctly. And you cannot see anything around you as God will help you see them. Because you cannot even understand God. And so the prophet is informing the nation at this point that God will visit them with judgment. And the way he puts it here is like saying, hey, it's too much. God, judge these people. Do not forgive them. That's what he said in the last part of our time. Do not forgive them. It's too much. You know, you've been defending someone, you've been talking on his behalf, and the fellow keeps doing the wrong thing. Ah, you get to the point that you get tired now. It's okay, I'm done with you. And so at this point, the prophet is telling the nation that God's judgment is imminent. It is coming. And there is no hiding place from God's judgment. See? When God's judgment is coming your way, forget it. No hiding place. You, where, will you hide? where will you go to? And that is why in verse 10 we see how that the nation will scramble for a hiding place from the terrifying appearance of the Lord and His judgment. They were used to running away during the Assyrian invasion. Running into caves and holes and hiding. Because, you see, the Assyrians have terrified the war. If you want to define terror, just look at an Assyrian at that time. The Assyrians were the embodiment of terror itself. But the prophet is telling them here that the terror of the Assyrians is very small. Because God is worse terror than the Assyrians. Whether they knew that, I'm not sure. But the prophet is drawing their attention to the facts that if God will visit them, it will be more terrifying than the Assyrians. He was coming, but of course, with the splendor of his majesty to show his strength, his power, and his dominion. So that they will see him as the mighty God that they have. And to come to him in humility and in repentance. But instead, we were running away. And that's an act of pride. Installing people and idols in the place of God and maybe projecting yourself is an act of pride. And so God's judgment is a way of asserting his authority so that he will bring back his children to himself. And that is why the response would have been repentance, a sign of humility. But you see, even the running away to hide is actually a sign of pride. It will look like a sign of fear, but it's also a sign of pride. Well, it's something close to what we experience in our various relationships. When there is something that needs to be addressed, whether it's between spouses or between siblings or friends, you avoid the other part. That's running away. You're running away. Be careful, because that can drive you to the place of pride. Reconciliation is what is required. And that's what the children of Israel were supposed to look for. But they were running away. Simple. Repent. But they were running away. It is when 
when Yahweh will appear, you will humiliate them until they run into caves and holes to hide from who is truly high. To show them that where they were standing is wrong. The purifying anger of the Lord, as we see the second point, is to recreate a right view of God in man. From verse 11 to 18, we've seen how God will do that in recreating the right view of himself in the children of Israel. See, it's not as if they didn't know God before. They knew God. But because Israel failed to maintain the godly culture of passing on the tradition down the generations, syncretism entered. Other religions were mixed with the worship of God. The nation had forgotten who Yahweh was. And so there was a need for a reorientation so that Israel can know how to relate right with God again. And because God loved this nation, He gave them ways for them to continue to maintain this true and right knowledge of Him. After every seven years, they were supposed to do a ceremony of covenant renewal so that the history will be reiterated. The covenant agreements will be reread before the nation. And aside that, Deuteronomy chapter 6 will tell us how they were supposed to raise their children. But they failed to do all of these things. And so generation after generation kept coming, and those traditions were not sustained, and the, and the only thing they could relate with was the pagan practices of their neighbors. I see the same thing happening with our world today. I see a generation coming on, a generation that does not care about godly values, a generation that is not yielding herself to serving God, a generation that has taken the most important things of God and, and they've apportioned a small time for it and still expect God's blessings. I am worried when I see the generation of today, I am worried. Believe me, if we continue in this way, this is not a prophecy. Just read between the lines. Look at some of the quote unquote developed nations, mostly from the West, that were Christians and that the ethos of those nations were founded on biblical principles. They've abandoned those ones. Where are they today? They are suffering. Because they have removed God in every of their narrative. The same thing is happening with us. We are, sit we are, we are sitting here and we are pointing hands at them and even bragging that we are sending missionaries back there. You are missing the point. When I see the way that our young people take life and God is absent in it, I worry. And my worry is what kind of children will there is? What values will you give them? When I see how some of our young people dress today, they live very little to the imagination. I say that in the future generation, young people will walk naked in the streets. Oh yes. Because now, they are walking half naked. The next one, they will walk naked. If Jesus does not come, I don't know what will happen to the one after that one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this should lead us to cry, to lament, because we are in trouble. We are sitting on time of, and we do not know it. And when we talk about this, you call us old fashioned. I'm not cursing anyone. No. But be careful. Watch it. Watch it and see. Your children can never be better than you. If you are worse, if you are bad, they will be worse. If you are good, they will be best. That is how God planned it. And in case you are wondering why the children of Israel have to face this, this is the reason. Failure to pass on godly heritage to the next generation. So God will take the initiative himself to achieve this, to bring his children back to himself. And believe me, it will be a harsh experience for man. For the children of Israel, it was very harsh. If you remember, they had to go to one. Exile. They were subjected to slavery so that God will recreate a right view of himself in their minds. God 
he's able to repeat the same thing with you. And when he does that, it's out of his love. It's out of his compassion. It's out of his mercy. So that he wants, so that he bring us back home. So when we don't worship God right, we will face hard situations. We don't know why we are facing situations we are facing in our country. But are the situations driving us to call on to God? Or are they trying to take us to some other place to seek solutions? When man puts self in God's place, it will drive one to ignorance and to arrogance and ego. To refuse to humble self. Simple, I'm sorry. Even among us humans in our daily relationships, to offend someone and say sorry is a problem. It's a big problem. We have placed some people to become superhumans above God. We call it hero worship. See, at the heart of hero worship is the desire to be like that hero as well. But the Lord said in verse 11 and 12 that he himself will humble the proud and the arrogant. If you look at verse 13 to 16, you will see how the prophet used natural things that people will look at in amazement to describe how the Lord will deal with the proud. For example, the cedars of Lebanon and the ox of Bashan, these were powerful trees. If you've been there, even in, in, in current world, you will see a few of them. But if you look at this tree, these woods were known as the best of the best of their own time. You will remember that some of these woods were contributed to the temple building by these nations to King David before Solomon came and used them for building the temple. Very mighty trees to behold. And the prophet will call the towering mountains. Of course, for them, the immediate one will be the Mount Sinai. And for us, maybe there are many other mountains you can think about. Kilimanjaro and many other beautiful mountains, uh, like the great canyons in the States. And which one do we have here in Jobs? You remember that one along the outside? That one that is always shown on TV. Mighty and beautiful mountains. Who placed them there? God. You know, science will give you some explanation. For, forget science. <laughs> God placed them there. And then the prophet will move from the things that God has created that people focus upon instead of seeing from them to learn to worship God. And he moved to the creations of men. He talks about the mighty towers. And I think one of the very prominent buildings we had in existence would be the Twin Towers in the US, where we saw pure evil acting, bringing those towers down. That site would never leave the minds of people that saw it. But then, other towers that we have in places like Dubai and the rest of them it has become a tourist attraction. In fact, now I heard that there is one tower, it does not stand straight, it is moving. <laughs> Knowledge. The wisdom of men has grown so high that men have become gods. You know, we were told here that the best a man can become is a man, a human being. Anything more than that is actually less. Anything other than that, a man is becoming an idol. And when a man becomes an idol, an idol is even less than a man. Man cannot become God. And then the fortresses that men have built to say to themselves, we are protected. You remember Ezekiel? When they said, we are the Medes, and this city of Jerusalem is the port, and we are preserved and protected inside. But what happened? When the Babylonians hit, they were running into caves like rats. Nobody is safe from the anger of the Lord when it comes. Men have built great walls in history. I can remember the walls of China, one of the seven wonders of the world. How about the, the ships, the military ones and the ones for business, showing how people depended on their economic power, how people depended upon their military might, and how that is still happening even today. But ships will sink. How about Titanic? Do you remember the story? It was said of one of the, whether the designer or the owner, when they talked about the security level of the ship, he said, even God himself cannot sink the ship. But the first voyage of that ship, he never reached her destination. Recently, 100 years of uh, Titanic was celebrated. 
another of its type took on the journey. And on board were some of the grandchildren of those who perished in the first Titanic. And when they reached the very point that the first Titanic sank, they parked there and they observed some memorial. Some of you may probably be thinking Titanic is just a movie. It actually happened. And after they observed the memorial, that the new Titanic now continued and completed the journey. 100 years after. Trees will be fair. Fortresses will be pulled down. But those who trust upon the Lord, they are like Mount They will never be shaken. Nothing will shake the train of God. Even in this nation that we live in uncertainties, nothing will shake the train of God. All of the crafts of men, they will perish. All of the things that men will put their trust in other than God, they will perish. But our Lord will remain firm forever. Children of Israel began to worship the creations against the Creator. They allow those things to take their attention. That's what Christ does. Draw you, draw people to self. People worship themselves now. In fact, I read about a woman who married herself. That is why Moses took time to tell the children of Israel where they were coming from. That it was God that created them. See, we come from God. And so we want to think and do things in line with what God has asked us to do. But you see, those who think they, they have emanated from baboons, is it baboons or what? Apes, right? Okay. You know like gorillas or apes or baboons, whatever. But we still have apes, right? They've not uh, metamorphosed into humans, and humans are not changed into something different, maybe more superior than what we have today. So people who think they came from animals will behave like animals. Why do you think things are happening the way they are happening with some people? Check their belief system. But we are sons and daughters of God. We ought to live like God's children. The children of Israel missed it and they paid the ultimate price. If we miss it today, we will pay for it then. May the Lord deliver us. The last point talks about to instill the fear of God in man. So the purifying anger of the Lord is to put the fear of God in the heart of man. See, the prophet is telling them from verse 19, 22, that the terror God will visit the children of Israel with is so that they will fear him alone. It's so that they will worship him only. See, I, I think man needs to fear God. I mean, even terrifying fear. We need to fear God above all. But you see, because God has brought himself close to us in love, does not mean that he is cheap to play with. Do you know that many people fear Satan today more than they fear God? Even the name they don't want to call Satan. They are thinking if they call the name Satan, man, the name alone will initiate them. Is that not correct? And thanks to Nigerian films, they are helping us so much in that regard. Anytime they will do evil stuff, you will see even the beats will change. Even you that is watching, the hair in your body will begin to stand on edge because evil is appearing. So people fear evil more than they fear God. I think people need to remember that our God is a consuming fire. Oh yes. You know, he said, do not fear those who have the power to destroy the body alone. But fear the one that has the power to destroy both the body and the soul and to even still put them in fire. That is the kind of God we serve. At least for me, I know that is what I serve. That's why I fear him. Fear him. But the fear the prophet is talking about here is the reverent fear that is coming out of a response of love. See, love calls out love. 
And that's what God is looking, at, uh, looking for from his children. And because he has made himself so available to us, his love should not be mistaken with weakness. Do you know that our religions of old thrived on fear? The worship of idols of past, the masquerades we have, were those, were those things not to instill fear? That's what. Well, to put fear in people. And the penalty they will charge you with. Like I'm looking at Peter now, the way you're looking at me, I can ask you to bring a black boat tomorrow. <laughs> Is that not how people of old treated those in, in the pagan practices? You do one something, you bring a ticket. You do another thing, you bring a goat. You do something, you bring something. Ah, you know that if you are not careful, your tickets will finish. Ah, so you will fall in line. So Peter fall in line. <laughs> the day of the Lord, that's what the prophet kept repeating the children of Israel. As it was said, 99 days for the thief and one day for the other. So the prophet is reminding them, the day of the Lord is coming and it is a day of judgment. You know this popular saying, let me give you a commentary of what this means. That if you see wildfire coming from the ocean, emanating from the ocean, you know, fire coming from water, it is not mix. So that when you see fire coming from the ocean to the land, they know that it is God Himself that is bringing it. And the only medicine to that fire is who? Is God. So if you find a situation where you are falling into the hands of God, you should run to who? That is the point that the prophet is raising. That the situation the children of Israel have entered and they are receiving God's judgment. It is God in a way calling them back to Himself. So if you find yourself in a similar situation, you need to ask yourself the question, is this God's judgment upon me? And if it is God's judgment, where do I need to go to? Back to God. <clears throat> and God in his wisdom, he wanted to separate the children of Israel with their idols. And look at what he did. In verse 21, that they will flee to caverns in the rocks and to the overhanging cracks from the fearful presence of the Lord. And the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shape the land. In fact, verse 20 says, In that day, people will throw away to the most and bats their idols of silver and idols of gold. You need to know most and bats. These are some kind of rats that don't have hair on their bodies, something like that, and they are in caves. And then bats, you know, they hide inside caves during the day. When it's night, they come out because the cave is very dark. So because of the love that this people have for their idols, when God will pursue them, they will run. See, they are calling on these idols to save them, and the idols are doing nothing. I guess during the last hour, they will realize that these idols are not going to do anything. So they will start running away, and in their flight, they will be throwing away the idols because the idols were adding to the weight of what they were carrying. Not that they were repenting. Don't think the throwing of the idols was because they were repenting. No! It was because they had become heavy. Now, God is using that medium to separate them with the idols. They will throw them in the caves. The bat is the most degraded bird in Israel. Nobody would associate with the bat. It was to show us the length and the extent to which God will humiliate the children of Israel. Sometimes we are humiliated before we come back to our senses. I pray it doesn't happen to us today. God is telling them in the last verse, stop trusting in mere humans. Because you see, mere humans that you are trusting upon them, they will fail you. In fact, the word will literally mean give up on men. Because you see, you've trusted men before and they have failed you. Why are you still trusting in men today? Give up. You're still tr you've trusted them enough. And I see this situation very, very close to us in Nigeria. How that especially the, the drums of politics are beating now. And the politicians will tell us fabulous things. We will build bridges, we will build roads, we will give employment. You know, like 2015, we were told that uh, how many employments will be given in a year? 
Three million. How many were given? No, no, actually the question you should be asking is how many jobs were lost? Today, we have other proxy. Some are using, some are using the, the, you see, the, in 2015, one group used the failure of the other to take them out. Today, another group is using the failure of this one to take them out. What is that telling you? Man will fail. Man can never promise you something and accomplish it. Forget it. It doesn't mean I'm saying you should not go to Let's go and vote. Let's go and vote. Okay? And, ex and, and exercise our rights. Let's vote. Because voting is for voting in and voting out. Let's go and vote. <laughs> but we are not voting because we trust in humans. We trust only in God. Humans will fail. We have seen it. They have failed. For me, I listen to the promises. They don't mean nothing to me. I only trust in God. If God wants us to have something, we will have it. So we need to learn from the past experiences, friends, so that when we vote, we are voting what we believe, that God is supreme. When man will want to help him from his own selfish end, so that tomorrow you will pay back. I want to conclude with these few words. See, if you take time to study people and nations, you will see that there are many ways people and nations try to put themselves in the place of God. They try to show their military might. I was listening to Russia recently, that they're going to invent the biggest of all bombs on earth. And then what? That's the question. Then what? Are you going to shoot that bomb at someone? All of us will perish together with you that is sending the bomb. So what's the, what's, the, what, I mean, what's the importance of that? You see men, people, humans, forget it. We've put ourselves in the place of God. God has given us good things so that these things will serve us. But we've become servants to the things that God has given to us for our own use. The priority, the value that we've projected upon these things, they're very wrong. There are some that are very good, like I said. Education, political power, military power, even beauty. You know, some people, they are, they are parents and their beauty is their God. When they look at themselves in the mirror, they say, wow, I'm beautiful. Have you done that before? <laughs> Pride. It's natural in us. It is ingrained in the flesh of human. Unless God's spirit gives us self-control, that sometimes even in our humility we are proud. Have you had someone before that said, "Oh, me, my my gift is humility." <laughs> even that statement alone. We will know if you are humble. You don't need to announce. <laughs> There's something that we're almost driven to showcase one way or another. Because man is short of the broken heart. But this is the secret, friends. What we need in our world today is Jesus. That's what we need. Jesus is what we need. And he has placed us here to be that light to preach his gospel all over the world for people to know the Savior and to submit themselves under his worship. That is the only way we can find the respite, respite in these times that we live in. I see people who say, we love Jesus. In fact, we carry the bands in our hands. What will Jesus do? I think the Grammys are happening today. Many people, some new heroes will emerge. And then they will have followership that is looking as if it is more than believers in the world. When Jesus is right here with us, we have put him in the background. And so the, the, the message to us today is this, that our primary concern is not our needs, but the Creator, who can take care of our needs. That's what Matthew is telling us in chapter 6, verses 33. 
instead of making ourselves to be God to take care of ourselves, I beseech us all to submit to the Almighty God and allow Him to take care of us. He wants to do that. He wants to do that. What is that idol that you are holding? God is pursuing you. Throw it off. I call upon you today. I encourage you. I advise you. Whatever it is that God is pursuing you to shake it off, let it go and embrace God. And the Lord will bless us all today. Amen.